Just to give you a little bit about my background, I've been training birds professionally now for a quarter of a century. I got my start at Disney's Animal Kingdom and straight out of college, I started working at Animal Kingdom two weeks before they opened officially to the public. So I got to see this theme park grow up around me, but I also got amazing life experiences during that time. So this is a photo of a macaw flight that they do there called Winged Encounters. You would mostly find me at the mixed species free flight bird show that was for many years called Flights of Wonder. And so there I performed in shows. They do five or six shows a day, every single day, with a variety of birds of all different species, including parrots. And when I wasn't there, I would be back at our ranch facility helping to teach workshops for people that share their homes with companion parrots, for people that run rescues for companion parrots. Just as a side note, if you're thinking about bringing a parrot into your home, there are rescues that are overflowing with parrots that need good homes. And I always recommend considering a rescue parrot. I also did workshops for zoo professionals, other people in the field that are working and training their zoo animals. When I wasn't doing that, I was on the road producing and performing in free flight bird shows in zoos across the country. I even had the opportunity to raise money for parrot conservation at some of those shows, which was really fulfilling. Lots of traveling, lots of experience, lots of different venues, a lot of teaching both at conferences and workshops. These are just a few of the groups that I've been working with since then. And I continue to take on new facilities, trying to help them to help their birds. When I think about what does it really come down to at the core? Where do I start? How do I improve my relationship with my bird? The trust account is what comes to mind. This idea of a trust account is something that they talk about pretty wildly in the zoo field. Imagine that your relationship with your parrot could be represented by a piggy bank. Every time you put coins into this piggy bank, you're putting deposits in. You're putting trust coins in. You're building trust. What do deposits look like? Deposits look like anytime you do something that your parrot likes and anytime your parrot does something that you like and and you reward that parrot with something that they like. Let's say, for example, you ask your parrot to come towards you and your parrot approaches you and you deliver a treat, an almond or a cashew. And by delivering a treat that your parrot enjoys, you're building trust. Your parrot is learning that when I approach you, good things happen. You give me something of value, something that I like. Those are deposits. Deposits are also not just when we deliver treats, but we make deposits into the trust account every time we are good listeners. I'm not talking about listening to what your parrot vocalizes, but watching and responding to their body language. Let's say I go to approach my parrot and I want my parrot to step up on my hand. And as I move in, my parrot is sitting there and his feathers are very soft. And the minute I approach, the feathers slick back and they get very tight to the body. And the parrot sits up straight and I keep moving in and this bird starts to lean away from me. The minute that I see the feathers slick back and the bird sit up straight, if I were to stop what I'm doing and take a little step back and wait to see if my parrot's body language indicates that they are getting more comfortable if their feathers soften back up, that means I'm being a good listener. I'm watching their body language. I'm recognizing that something I'm doing is making them uncomfortable. And at the very first subtle signs of that uncomfortability, I'm taking a step back. That's also a deposit because our birds learn, oh, if I'm uncomfortable and I communicate that with my body language, my person is going to hear me. My person is going to see that and they're going to help make me more comfortable. That's how we make deposits. What does it look like when my bird approaches me? And what does it look like when my bird is trying to escape me? An escape is obvious. They fly away, they flee, they run away from us. But I'm talking about the subtle signs, when the feathers slick, when the eyes pin, when they sit up straight, when they start making quick eye movements, when they start looking around them for where they want to go that's not here. All of these subtle signs are things that we want to recognize because that's when we're making withdrawals and we want to be making lots of deposits. If our piggy bank is full of deposits and we accidentally scare our bird, or we accidentally make them do something they don't want to do, we're not going to bankrupt that trust account. But if we don't have a lot of deposits and we're making a lot of withdrawals, if we're forcing our birds to do things, if our bird's body language indicates that they're not willing participants in what we're doing, then that piggy bank is empty. Then you have a bankrupt trust account. You're in the red. Our goal is to have a conversation with our birds where we ask questions and we allow them to be a part of the response and we reward them and we thank them for doing the things that we ask of them. Instead of commanding my bird to step up or making 
asking my bird to step up or ordering my bird to step up. I ask my bird to step up. I say, will you step up? He lifts his foot to say, yes, I will. And then I provide that nice, steady, solid platform for him to step up. And I also give him a food treat. I say, thank you for doing what I asked. Here's a treat. And when we give him that treat from the bird's perspective, there's a chance he'll want to do that again in the future because he was able to do it at his own pace and he earned something that he wants in return. We always think about it from the animal's perspective. Why should I do this thing that you're asking me to do? Am I doing it to earn something that I want? Or am I doing it to avoid something I don't want? And so that's a withdrawal. When we think about withdrawals, it's as if we're pulling the plug out of that piggy bank and we're shaking out a bunch of our trust coins. And the thing is that it's not one-to-one. -one. So if I ask my parrot to step up and I give him one food treat, but then I go grab a towel and I grab him with a towel, I'm not just shaking out one trust coin. I'm shaking out 10 or 12 or 15 trust coins. That's why it's so important that we have a lot of deposits in that trust account. If we do have to take withdrawals, we're not bankrupting the account. Here's what withdrawals look like. Did you have a question? Yes, I had a question here. What do you do when sometimes your bird does escape and you have no choice but to bring him in or bring her in with a towel? Is there something like a towel training that one can do? Towel training, yes, we can talk about towel training and towel training is something that I do for medical exams because when you bring your parrot to the vet, they generally want to wrap them up in a towel. So you can teach your bird to voluntarily participate in many vet procedures, which is really valuable and super important because not only do you build trust when you teach those behaviors, but stress can weaken an immune system. And if your bird is getting severely stressed out, just for what it takes to get to the vet exam. And then on top of that, whatever is happening at the vet exam, that can be really detrimental for your bird's health. There are things that you can do. Protected contact target training. What I mean is that the bird is inside the cage with the door shut and we're on the outside. What we find is that all animals tend to be more comfortable and more willing to interact with us when they feel safe that we're not going to encroach on their personal space. But when our animals know that it's up to them if they choose to come and participate, otherwise they don't have to and we're not going to make them, they tend to want to participate more. Using that target training to train our birds to voluntarily come out of their cage and go back in on their own without having to get on our hand. Because getting on our body requires a huge amount of trust. If you think about a parrot in the wild, there is no perch that they will ever sit on that is as variable as our body in the way that our skin moves and we might flinch or our hair might blow. It takes a lot of trust. Before any of that, you can train your bird to voluntarily come out and go back in. In my professional world, we would never ever let a bird out of its cage if we didn't have a lot of confidence that we could get that bird back into its cage safely and voluntarily. We would never use a towel as the way to get our bird home. Some people have this feeling that their birds must have out of the cage time. To that, I talk about turning cages into castles and looking at the sizes of cages and how we can maximize the space for our birds. They have a lot to do within their cages. That outside the cage time is very important, but equally important is that they'll voluntarily go home reliably before you're letting them fly around the room. Otherwise, you're trying to make deposits, but you're taking these huge withdrawals, and so you're just treading water. Here's what withdrawals look like to me. When I see behavior like this, I know that I don't have a good relationship with this scarlet macaw. This body language very clearly tells me this bird wants me to back up. This is not me doing the video, by the way. But whoever this person is, this bird has shown significant body language before the lunge, before the bite, to tell me that it was not comfortable with me being that close in this situation. So I'm taking withdrawals as long as I'm staying in this bird space with all of that body language. Here's another example. This doesn't look as obvious. This bird doesn't seem to be in as much turmoil, but when you really look at it, when you look at this bird's body language and you see those big eyes and you see the slicked feathers, this bird is not playing a game. This bird is trying to ask this person to please stop doing that. And you can see when they scratch the macaw's head, the feathers don't fluff up as if the bird is enjoying it. We can watch that again. The feathers slick back and the bird is moving away. We see escape behavior. We see avoidance behavior. These birds are not willing participants in these behaviors and we're not being a good listener. It doesn't have to be huge in order for it to be a withdrawal. 
And the more of these withdrawals that we take, the harder it becomes to have a good trusting relationship with our birds. The good news is that behavior is always happening. And so even if we watch this and we say, that's me and that's the way I've been interacting with my bird and what do I do now? We can look at things with fresh eyes and we can start today to build better relationships with our birds. I always look at it from the bird's perspective. Why should I do the behavior that you're requesting of me? Do I want to or do I have to? Am I forcing this bird to do this or am I asking this bird to do this and are they getting something of value in it for them so that they want to do it more in the future? We try and figure out how do we set up the environment to encourage our birds to do the behaviors we'd like them to do. Step up, go back in the cage, go into a towel, drink from a syringe, get your nail trim, whatever it might be. How do we set up the environment to encourage those behaviors for them? How do we provide rewards or consequences that they enjoy so that they want to do those behaviors more? We don't want our birds to show escape avoidance behavior. We want them to show behavior that shows approach and wanting to participate. I learned this saying first in a class for foster parents. I'm a foster parent for human children. Every child that comes into foster care just because they're in foster care, they've been through a trauma. Those of us that are rescuing parrots from rescues, all of these birds have an unknown amount of trauma in their lives. There's a reason they have been brought to this rescue. There's a reason that they're on their second, third or fourth home. But the good news is, regardless of whatever happened, yes, past history is information and it's important, but what's more important is what's happening right now, what's happening today. Because right now, today, at this moment, the way that the science of behavior works with all animals, from amoebas to elephants, is that at any moment, we are always behaving to gain something that we want or to avoid something we don't want. Why do we get up in the morning? Why do we wear these clothes? Why do we eat this thing for breakfast? If it's hot in the sun, why do we go into the shade? If it's raining, why do we put up an umbrella? We're always looking to gain something we want or avoid something we don't want. It's the same thing with the animals. We take that and we look at how can we set up the environment. They're choosing to gain these things that they want. They're choosing to participate in the things that we would like them to do. And they're choosing to do it because they get something positive out of it as well.